Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. <laughs> Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code MONEY for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code MONEY for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code MONEY. Sci-Fi, The Holes Around Mars by Jerome Bixby Starship crews should be selected on the basis of their non-irritating qualities as individuals. No chronic complainers, no hypochondriacs, no bugs or cleanliness, particularly no, mon- no one-man parties. I speak from bitter experience. Because of the first expedition to Mars, Hugh Allenby, the damn near drove us nuts with his puns. We've only got, so we, we've only got, so we just ignored them. But no one could ignore the classic last one, written right in the annals of astronomy, and it's there to stay. Abbey in command of the expedition was first to set foot outside the ship. As he stepped down from the airlock onto Mars, he placed at foot on a convenient rock, caught the toe of his weighted boot in the hole in the rock, wrenched his ankles, smoked the ground with his pants, sitting there, eyes pained behind the transparent shield of his oxygen glass. He stared at the rock. It is about five feet high, only granite. No special shape and several inches of below its summit, running straight for it and then no voicely direction with neat round four inch hole. I'm upset by the whole thing, he grunted. The rest of us scrambled out the ship and gathered around this plump form. One or two of us winced at his miserable double pun. Break anything, Hugh? asked Burton, our pilot kneeling beside him. Get out of my way, Burton, said Appleby. Allenby, you have obstructed my view. Burton blinked. A man constructed long bones of caution. He angled out of the way, looking round to see what he was excru- ex- obstructing view of. He saw the rock and round the hole for it. He stood very still, staring. So did the rest of us. Well, I'll be damned, said Janice, a photographer. A hole in a rock, said Grandes, a botanist. Round, said Raldorf. Oh, bodiness. An artifact, finished Allenby Ad- softly. Burton helped us to his, helped him to his feet. So only we go around the rock. Janice bent down and put her eye into one end of the hole. I bent down and threw the other end. We skidded it with each other. As a mater- materiologist, I expected to opinionate. Not drilled, I said softly, but not chipped, not melted, certainly not eroded. I heard a grasping sound in my ear and straightened. But I was scratching a thumbnail along the rim of the hole. Weathered, he said. Pretty old, but I bet it's a perfect circle if we've made it. Janice was already fiddling with his camera, s- testing the coordination of the tiny distant sun with a minute. Let's see whether it is not it is or not, Annabe said. Burden brought out a steel tape measure. I was four and three eighths inches across, perfectly circular, about sixteen inches long, and four feet above the ground. But why, said Rodolph, why would anyone bore a four inch tunnel for a rockway out in the middle of the desert? Religious symbol, said Dennis. He looked around, one hand on his gun, where to keep an eye out. Maybe we landed on some sacred ground or something. A totem hole, perhaps, and a bee. Suggested, oh, I don't know, Redder said, said to Dennis, but not out of Annaby. I mentioned, 
We always ignored. As I mentioned, we always ignored Annabee's puns. Not a lack of ornamentation, not all typical of religious articles. On earth, Gomez reminded him. Besides, it must be Unitarian, not symbolic. Unitarian? How? asked Bert Janice. Altars for snakes, Burton said dryly. Well, said Annabee, you can't deny it has holy, it has holy aspects. Get your hand away, will you, Peters? asked Janice. I did, but Janice's camera did, had a click. I bent again and peered through the hole. It's sights on a low ridge over there. I said, maybe it's some kind of surveying setup. I'm going to take a look. Careful, warned Janice. Remember, we're, it may be sacred. <coughs> As I walked away, I heard Jadaby say, to take some scrapings from the inside of the hole, Gomez, you might be able to determine, it, determine if anything's kept in it. One of this, this stumpy, purplish, pearl type cacti we had a long vertical bite out of it. It somehow has, it somehow carefully carved out a narrow U shaped section from the top down, finishing the bottom of the U in a neat semicircle, with flat and clear cut, and an inside surface of shoe hole magnet. I hollered, the others came running, I pointed. Oh my god, said Annabee, another one, a purple cactus in around the U hole was dry and dead looking. Sonny Bolton, but then usually tape measure, a hole measured four and eight, three eighths and eight inches across. It's eight inches deep. Semicircle bottom was just, was about a foot above the ground. This ridge, I said, is about a three foot higher than those where we landed the ship. I bet the hole in the rock and the hole in the cat's cactus are the same level. Gomez said slowly, that's not done at, done at all once. As a result of prophetic attacks, look here and there. These tip tat that overlapping depression on the outer ledges of oh, the hole, he pointed. This side of the cactus, the size of the impact, and the skull effect on this side, wherever made the hole emerge, the juice is still oozing, not the point of impact, where the plant is desiccated, but below where the shot was transmitted. A distant shout turned us around, Burton was a rock beside a ship. He bended down, his eye on the further side of the mysterious hole. He looked for another second, for a second, and straightened, and came back to us at a lope. They line up, he said. We reached us. The bottom of the hole, and the cactus is right in the middle when you sight through the hole to the rock. If I, if there's somebody who came round and whacked the cactus regularly, did someone come round and whack the cactus regularly, Janice said. Looking around rarely. To keep the line of sight through the holes clear, I wondered, why not just remove the cactus? Religious, Janice explained. Gauntlet, he discarded, laid ignored on the ground. In the shadow of the cactus, we went on past the ridge towards an outcropping rock a hundred yards further on. We walked silently, each of us wondering if we had half expected. If we were, what we half expected would not really be there. It was one in a one of the tall weathered spires. The old cropping came ten feet below its peak and four feet above the ground was a four inch hole. Annaby sat down on a rock, nursing his ankle, and remarked that anyone who believed his crazy business was that really happening he must have holes in the rocks, in the rocks in his, in his head. But then put his eye to the hole and whistled six feet long of an inch, he said. Another end, just a pinpoint. But did you see it? The damn thing's perfectly straight. I looked around the way, back the way we came. The cactus stood on the ridge with its U-shaped bait. And beyond was the ship. Beside, it was a perforated rock. We surveyed. I said, I bet the holes would be all lined up right to the last millimetre. I ran off. Randolph complained, why would anyone go out and bore holes in things all along a line through the desert? Religious journalist muttered, I don't mean, I don't, don't, doesn't have to make sense. We stood there by the outcropping and looked out along the wide red desert beyond its stretch flatly for miles from its crisis south towards 
Mars great equator, mar dead sand wastes crisscrossed by the channels which we observed or landing to be great straggy patches of vegetation, probably stung along underground water flows. Boing, boing, you jump half out of skins, ozone, hit out of our nostrils, our hair stirred, electrical uproar. Look, Janice chattered, lowering his smoking gun. About forty foot on the left, a small rapidly creature poked its head from behind a rock. It stared at us after horror. Just raise his gun again. Don't bother, said I retirely. I don't think it intends to attack. But I'm sure it isn't a marsh of religious conventions. Jazz wet his lips and looked at the little shame face. I guess I'm kind of taught. That, that's, that's what I taught, said Annaby. The creature darted from behind its rock, looking us over its shoulder, employed six legs to make it small but very fast tracks. We turned our attention again to the desert, far out back against Mars, a shore horizon with a line of low hills. Shall we go look? asked Barton, eyes gleaming at the mystery. Dennis hefted his gun nervously. It was still crackling faintly from discharge. I say, let's go back to the ship. Adam sighed. My leg hurts, he studied the hills. Get me the field glasses. Radoff planned them over. Adam put them on to shield his mask. With his mask and just them. After a moment he sighed again. There's a there's a hole on the planet's surface. Catches the sun. A down a lousy damn round little impossible hole. These hills, Burton observed. Must be thousands of feet thick. The other one lasted all the way back to the ship. Dennis held holding out his belief that the whole thing was religious origin. Kept looking around for Martians, expecting the poor screaming from the hills. But then came up with suggestion that perhaps the holes been made by his disintegrating ray. Puzzle had not been be permitted. It might have been the scene of some great battle. With, oh, with only one such weapon, I ejected. And he swore as he stumbled. What do you mean? I hadn't seen any other hole, lines of holes. Only one it's a, in a battle. The whole joint should be cut up. It was good a few moments silence that fault. And he said, it might have been brought out by one side at the last result. So the ice in the hole, he resisted the temptation mutiny. But would, but would even one such weapon in battle, only make one line of jerk holes, would be in it play, played in arc against the enemy? You know, you know it would. Well, when it, when it cut slices out of the landscape to the boring holes, would it sway or vibrate for enough, make holes miles away from it? Everything else, less than perfect hole circles. It would, could be have been firmly mounted. You, does that, that sound like a practical weapon to you? Two seconds of silence. On the other hand, he, he said, so the war, the whole thing might have been designed to frighten some primitive race, or even some kind of beast, holes out there. Out of here, a demonstration, religious, Janice mumbled, still around looking around. He walked on, passing the stratus, the low ridge. Interesting, said God, that is the evidence that everything Causes for honour has happened again and again. Afraid at war, like that the war ferry. Oh my God! Grasped Robert and he stared at him. The ship, he whispered, is right in line with the hole. If we ever made this, it's still in operation. Run! Yelled Adbury. He ran like fiends. Got the ship into the air, out of line of the holes. So we were firmly hoped for safety. Then we realised we were admitting our fear. That a mysterious homemaker might still be lurking around, while well, the evidence was all was all was all of it. As gone as remind us, the cactus was been oozing. It cruised at 20,000 feet and fought it over. Janice had never was only trained was in photography. He said some kind of ominous animal, a bird, each rocks and something. I'm not totally discounting the notion of such animal. Rather, I've said. I will resist to death, suggesting that it forages with dramatic precision. But while well, Anna Marie said, Land, that Bolton, by the canal, lots of plant life, fauna too. We'll do, it, we'll do a little collecting. But then set down feather light. And the very edge just pulled in fat sparks of vegetation, committing a scene behind him, his native Texas pear flats. We wandered into the air, such each of a set burden to his speciality. Radoff relentlessly stalked 
about another the rabbity creatures. Gomez was carefully digging up plants, stowing them in jars. Dennis was busy with his camera, recording every aspect of Mars transferable to fill metalbury. Annabry walked around helping anybody who needed it. Astronomer, he'd done half his work on the way to Mars. We'll do the other half on a turn trip. Burn lounge in the sun, his back against the ship's fin. Play chess with Annabry, who was calling out his moves in ball roar. I grubbed my for rocks. My search took me further and far away from the others. What I could do, what I could find around the canal was gravel. I wanted to chip some, I wanted to chip at some big stuff. I want, I walked towards a look, look, long rays of half a mile away or so. Beyond there rose an exciting ray of high sized boulders. As I moved out of earshot, I heard a snarl, Bulletin. Will you stop yelling KT to K2 and check? Every time you open your yap, this critter takes off on me. Then I saw the groove. It started right there. The ground began to rise, a thin, shallow curve, a groove in the dirt at my feet. And then inch by inch, of course, running off straight. Toward higher ground, with my eyes glued to it, I walked the ground around, slowly rose. The groove even widened. Now it's about three inches across, about one and a half deep. I walked on, holding my breath. Four inches wide, two inches deep. Ground rose more, some more. Four and eight, four eighths wide. I didn't have to measure it, I knew. Now the ground rose and edges of the groove began to curve inward. Oh, the groove, they touch. No more groove. The ground had risen. The groove had stayed level and gone underground. But now it wasn't a groove. It was a round tunnel, a hole, a few places further on. I found the ground my heel where the hole ought to be. The dirt crumbled and there was a little dark tunnel running straight into both directions. I walked on the ground, falling away, gradually away. Away, falling away, gradually again. The entire process was repeated in reverse. Hairline appeared in the dirt, widened between lips and drew slowly apart to reveal a neat, straight, four-inch groove which sank as slowly as the shadow line of the ground and vanished. Looked ahead of me, there was a low ridge of ground behind me and enormous boulders, a neat four-inch semicircle. Bending out of it, the very top of the ridge, a house-sized boulder directly beyond was a four-inch hole. Adaby, Annaby winced and called the others when they call, came back and reported. Mystery deepens, he told them. He turned to me, lead on, Peters, your temporary drill leader. Thank God he didn't say fall in. The holes went straight through the rest of the boulders. Be a hole in one and ten or twenty feet further in than the next boulder. Another hole, and another, and another, right through the nest in line, about thirty holes in all. But then standing by the boulder I'd first seen flashed his flashlight. The hole ran off, ran off clear on the other side. The jumble nest eyed to the hole saw it, straight as a stream. The ground stoked away in the further side of the nest. Some holes are visible in that direction. Some just miles of desert. So we stared at the holes for a while. Then go, didn't go away. We headed back to the for canal. Any impossibility? asked Janice. We thought it could be a natural phenomenon. No straight lines in nature, Randolph said. A little shortly, it goes, that goes for a bunch of circles. A straight line and for perfect circles too. A planet is a circle, objected Janice. A revelerate stephaloid. Stephaloid, Abbey corrected. A planet's orbit. A clips. Janice walked in a few steps, frowning. Then he said, I remember reading that it's something down near perfect circle nature. He paused a moment. Potholes, he looked at me. And as a radiologist to cooperate. Today, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all the entertainment you love without the hassle. DirecTV Stream brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, which means you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So stop waiting and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. 
Do you still listen to music on cassette tapes? Do you still connect to the internet with dial-up? No? Then why are you still using a data warehouse? The data warehouse had a great run, but it's outdated. It wasn't built for 90% of today's data. It can't handle modern use cases like machine learning. It's time for a new paradigm. The Databricks Lakehouse brings all your data together on one open platform so you can tackle every use case from BI to AI. Discover Lakehouse at Databricks.com. What kind of potholes, I said, Curacy? Do you mean those where part those part of a limestone deposit was dissolved? No. And once when the glacier passes through a hard rock, lying so much softer rocks, it grinds the hard rock down into softer and red, over them sort of wear down to fit together. All ends up with a round hole in a soft rock. Privy you rock, neither rock, I told Janice, will be homogamous. The softer parts will be buried faster in the soft stone. The end result wouldn't be a perfect circle. Janice's face fell. Now, I said, would anyone care to define this term, perfect circle? We've been throwing around so politely, because he, such holes as Janice describes are often pretty damn round. Rana said, well? You settled them, Garber said. You're sarcastic. Your diverse discussion, gentlemen, has established just a long, the long horizontal holes we found are caused by glacial action. Oh no, Dennis argued oh, seriously. I once read the Mars never had any glaciers. All of us shuddered. Half an hour later, we spotted more holes about a mile down the canal, still lying marching around the forest through cracked high rocks, hills, even through one edge of the low vegetation, the canal of forty feet or so. Damaging and to bend down and look straight through the curling, twisting grove a round tunnel from either end. We followed the holes for a mile, a mile to the rim of an enormous saucer like valley that sank gradually before us until miles away, was thousand feet deep, we started across, stared out across it, wandering about the other half side. Anna Bree said determinedly, we burrow to the bottom of those holes once and for all. Back to shipmen. He hopped back, climbed in, and took off. At an altitude of fifty feet, burden lined the nose as ship the most recent line of holes flew down from over the valley. On the far side was a range of hefty hills. I was went through them, straight through we would approach one hill, burden would manipulate the front through screen till we spotted the hole. We could we would pass over the hill and spot another end of the hole. A rear screen. One hole was 280 miles long. Four hours later, we were halfway around Mars. But right Elvis stepped round off, was sitting by a port side, chin in one hand, his eyes unbelieving. All around the planet, he said repeatedly. All around the planet. Halfway at least out of Annabry moves. And we can assume that it continues in a straight line through or anything and everything that gets in its way. He glazed out the front port of the uneven blue green haze, canal off to our left. For the love of heaven, why? And every fell down. Well, we all did. But then suddenly slapped at the bottom at the control board and the ship braked and sank a plump duck. At the sec- last second, Brosen popped up the rose, short burst, and ten feet wheels hit to the land sand of five hundred yards. We chose to stop. Adderby got to, up from the floor. What do you do that? He asked Burton, politely nosing, nursing above his elbow, but his nose was almost touching the front port. Look, he said, and pointed. About two miles away, the Martian village looked like a handful of yellow marbles flung out in the desert. We checked our guns. We put our oxygen ma- on our oxygen masks. We checked four guns out. We checked our guns again, put on at the ship, Got a ship made down sure the airlock was locked. An hour later we called inch by page city inch a huge sand dune and poked our heads around over the top. The margins are runts. The tallest of them less than five feet tall, skinny as a pencil, dried up and brown. They wore line cloths of woven fiber. They stood amongst the dusty looking inverted bowl buildings of their village. Every one of them was looking straight up at us with unblinking brown eyes. Six safeties of our six guns clicked off like rattled dice. 
and Marjan stood there and gulped. Probably a highly developed sense of hearing, this thin atmosphere, Anna Bree murmured. Heard us coming. He thought that the, the landing person was an earthquake. Out uh, Radeth grumbled surly. Mars quake, corrected Giles. Jabez, once to look at the village, scrawny occupants, seemed to have convinced him that his life was in no danger. Holding the margins covered, we examined the village from atop the 30-foot dune. The dune-like buildings were constructed with something that looked like a boat. No windows, probably built with sandstones in mind. That's on mind. With doors, were about halfway up the sloping sides. Each door of stone ramp would wound down round the house to the ground again with sandstorms in mind. No, no, the drifting dunes wouldn't block the entrances. The centre of the village was a wide street, a long sandy area, some thirty feet wide. Other side of it, houses are scattered at random, as if each margin simply hunted for a comfortable place to sit and then put a house around it. Look, whispered Randolph. While Marjan stepped from a group situated far side of the street from us, he started across the street, his round brown eyes on us, his small bare feet flooding the hand. He saw, in addition to his line cloth, he wore drury, a habit of metal ring, a brace at one skinny ankle, a sound called a coppicious scream, his broad, narrow head. We saw a band of metal there, just above where his eyebrows should have been. The silver chief and the muttered, Oh, shame on me. The bewildered, jeweled Martian approached the centre of the street. He glanced briefly at the gra- ground at his feet. He raised his head, stepped with dignity across his centre of the street, came on towards us, passing the dusty-looking buildings, his realm, the dusty-looking groups of his subject. He reached the slope of dune, he lay on, paused, raised small hands over his head, arm towards us. I think, Adderbury said, that's an anthropologist will give odds. The suggestion means peace. He stood up, holstered his gun without buttoning the flap, and raised his hands over his head, wielded modern language, considered squeaks. It made friendly noises. The chief squeaked, and pretty soon we were in the centre of the group wide eyed version. We were the centre of a group of wide eyed merchant merchants. None of them made a, none made a sound. Exactly no one dared Evidently, no one dared peep when the spit chief spoke. Very likely, most articulate Martians simply squeaked themselves into a job. And the Rebo, of course, said they just squeaked by. Going for the business of drawing a country with aesthetic cut circles in the sand, pointing to the third orbit away from the sun, thumping its chest. The crowd around us kept growing as more Martians emerged from the dome buildings to see what was going on. Down the winding ramps of buildings on the sides of the wide, sandy street they came, and in front of buildings on the other side of the street, prodding through the sand, blinking brown eyes at us. Not a sound, not making a sound. Annaby pointed at the third orbit and thumped his chest. The chief squeaked and thumped his chest and pointed at the copperish band on his head. And he pointed at Annaby. You seem to have conveyed to him, Adabri. I see. I seem to have conveyed to him, Adabri said dryly. In fact, I'm chief of your party. Well, let's say try again. He started over on the new bits. Didn't seem to be getting anywhere. At least the rest of watched the Martians and said, "Last hum- handful straggling across the wide street." Chris said, "Gomez, know what happens when we reach the centre of the street? Each Martian, upon reaching the centre of the street." Lost his feet just for a moment, without even breaking a stride, and then came on. Like, what can they be looking at? Gomez wondered. The chief did it too, but it moves. Remember when we first came towards us? We all stayed intently in the middle of the street. We saw absolutely nothing but sand. Martian milled around us and watched Adamby in his orbits. A Martian child appeared from behind two buildings across the street of six. Each legs. He started to cross, got halfway, glanced back downward and came on. I don't get it, but and said, What the hell are they looking for? That? The child reached the crowd and squeaked a thin high note. A number of things happened at once. Several members of the group around us glanced down along the edge of the crowd nearest the centre of the street as a milestone of intervals drifted off to either side. Quite casually, nothing at all urgent about it. It just moved con. con- 
concertedly to get further away from the centre of the street, not trying to take the interest gaze of a one second of process. Even the chief glanced up when from Grand Prix's contritic circles, a child's squeak. Ranoff had been fidgeting uncomfortably and paying very little attention to a conversation. Suddenly, he must answer nature's call. He moved off to the dunes surrounding the village, or rather, he started to move. The moment he felt set off across the wide street, the margin chief was in front of him, brown eyes wide, hands out before him as it was thrust. Ranoff back, but again, six safeties clicked. Margin didn't blink at the sudden appearance of our guns. But the only weapon they recognised was a club or maybe a rock. Well, what can the matter be, Radoff said. He took another step forward. The chief squeaked and stood his ground. Radoff had to stop or bump into him. Radoff stopped. The chief squeaked, looking right into the ball of Radoff's gun. Hold still, Radoff, he told Radoff. Tell, do we know what's up? Adderby made an interrogative sound to the chief. The chief squeaked and pointed to the ground. He looked, looked he pointed at his shadow. I have stared completely. Turned completely. Hold, hold still, better he warned him. Again, he made a crushing sound. Chief pointed to the street. Then he looked, pointed down the street. He bent to touch his shadow, thumbing it with his tin fingers. He pointed at the wall house nearby. We all looked. Straight lines had been painted on a row of brick covered walls up and down across the form. Many small squares, about four inches across. Each square was a bit of squiggly writing, blackish paint, a little wooden peg jutting out the wall. Bernard said, looks like a damn crossword puzzle. Look, said Dennis, lower right corner, a metal ring hanging from one of the pegs. That was all we saw on the wall. Hundreds of squares with figures in them, small peg in each, a hanging ring hanging on one of the pegs. You know what, and Bree said slowly, I think it's a calendar, just a second... Thirty six squares wide by twenty feet two feet as six hundred and sixty. That done on line was twenty six twenty seven squares. Six hundred and eighty seven squares in all. That's how many days there are in the Martian year. He looked thoughtfully at the metal ring. I bet that ring is hanging from the peg it represents a day. You must move it along each day to keep track. What's the kind of got to do when we're crossing the street, Randolph asked, pain tone. <clears throat> he started to take another step, treat squilt, squeaked, feel a matter of desperation, concern, make us understand. Randolph stopped again and swore impatiently. And the bee made his questions in sound again then. The chief pointed him out at his shadow, and the communal candor, but he could see now what he pointed, that he pointed at a ring. But it says slightly, I think he's trying to tell us that this is today and such such a time of day. I bet he's using his shadow as the sundown. Perhaps, Danbury granted. But I said, if this monkey doesn't let me go, let him go in another minute, Squeak, Chief squeaked, his eyes concerned. Stand still, Danbury ordered. He's trying to warn you of some danger. The Chief went out to the street again and then, instead of squeaking, we revealed that there was another sound in his command. He said, whoosh, who was stared at the end of the street. Nothing but a wide avenue between the houses. High sand. Down, June, down at the end of it, which we looked, had first looked upon the village. The chief described a large circle, one hand sweeping in hand, but his head down to his knees, up again, as fast as he could. He protruded his monkey lip, pursed his monkey lips and said, Whoosh! Made a circle again. A margin emerged from the door on the side of the houses across the avenue. Blinked at the sun, as he had best woken. Then he saw what was going on below and blinked again. This time in, this time in interest. He made his way down across, around the winding lamp and started across the street. About halfway he pulls a red can on the house wall, glanced at his shadow. He got down to his knee, hands and knees and called across the middle of the street. Once past the middle, he woes, walked, the rest of the way to join the groups and calmly stared at us along the rest of them. They're all crazy, Randolph said disgustedly. I'm going to cross that street. Shut up. It's a certain time of a certain day. And we moves. And for the way the chief is acting, he's afraid he'll got 
for you to cross the street with that other one just called by God. Do you know what this might tie in with? We saw for a moment. The God said, of course. Burton said, the holes. Exactly, said Henry. Maybe whatever made or makes the holes goes right down the centre of the street here. Maybe that's why they built this village this way, to make room for. For what, Randall said, unhappily shifting his feet. I don't know, Henry said. I looks thoughtful, look thoughtful at the chief. <clears throat> that circle of motion he made could have been describing something that went around and around the planet. Something like, oh no, that would be his eyes glaze. I don't believe it. In a million years, he gazed round about where he went to the far end of the street, high sand dune that rose there. The chief seemed to be waiting for something to happen. I got a call, Randolph stated. He got to his hands and knees and began to crawl across the centre of the avenue. Chief let him go. So he was at the end of the street, sunny erupted. A forty foot sprout of dust shot straight out of the sloping side. Some bullet had emerged. Powdered sand hazed the air. Yellowed in all enormous full strength of the avenue. Grains of sand stung the skin and rattled minutely on the houses. Whoosh! When I flopped flat on his belly, he didn't have to continue the trip. He had made other arrangements. Night on the ship. Well, we all sat around. Still shaking our heads. Every once in a while, Anbury talked with Earth. He sat there with wearing no headphones, trying to make himself understood by the golf, golf static. That silly small body, he repeated wearily. He doesn't believe in audience. About four inches in the but it travels mean distance of four feet above the surface of the planet. If there's a velocity yet to be calculated, unique nature results in many of those. I was heard, I might say, more imagined phenomena. Imagined phenomena. He stared blankly in front of him for a moment, measured the understood statement of his life. And did the understatement of his life, the discovery made necessitate a re examination how many of our basic postulates in, sci- in physical sciences, headphones, sculpt. Patiently, Adam Reed assured of he was entirely serious and the re state. Literated the results of observations. Suppose that he was an astronomer with twice as fabricated as the rest of us. On the other hand, perhaps he's quite better quick than just to the evidence. Exactly, he said. When the body was formed, it travelled at such fantastic velocity that he would hit two voices on a whisper, punch holes in things, the headphones squawked. It rocks out of what he said. It mounted anything that got its way, and now the whole was a form a large portion of its object. Squawk. The mass must be an order of squawk. Process of making the hole slowed it so that it now travels just fast enough squawk. Maintain its orbit and pretenary occasional objects such as squawk. Sound of squawk. My God, I don't. I know it's a mathematical monstrosity. Monstrosity. And a beast now. I don't. I don't. I don't put it. I didn't put it there. Squawk. And be was silent for a moment. Then he says, like, a name. Squawk. Hmm, said Henry. Well, well, he appeared to brighten to the little So, it's up to me as leader of mission to name it. Squawk. Very well, then. Very well, he said. A chop licking tone was his, was his voice. Heard it all too often before. He said, waiting. It's as much as Mars, Adamus, Moon, it's called Edmurus, and ex He said, I think I should name the third, third moon of Mars, Bottomus.